Okay, so um, we, the floor is now open for, for questions or, and or comments. Keep your comments brief, if you wouldn't mind. Um, I think there are a whole bunch of issues. The, st the strategic issue that Duncan raised, which is about how do we actually negotiate a really good housing policy for the future of Sydney. Um, that deals not only with um, sort of social housing, affordable housing, and private sector housing. How do we actually balance that right across Sydney and, and get the right kind of programs happening? Um, Wendy raised the important issue of how do we engage our communities um, right from the beginning, not just when they've, been when they've received the letter telling them that they are having to go, but right at the beginning when we're thinking about how do we actually restructure some of these communities. Um, and then Richard talked about the two programs being run out of facts, which, which are basically, and the state government, which are basically programs. They're not the same thing as the programs being run by urban renewal, mm. urban growth, mm. where state government land is just um, available for um, basically social housing and private sector housing, and at the moment has no real affordable housing targets attached. So if we're looking at value uplift um, or for those lands, how best do we return some of that, that uplift back into more affordable housing um, as well as replacing the social housing? So I think there are a lot of really important and gritty issues in that. So um, David at the back has a very long um, microphone and if anybody would like to put their hand up I'll get to all of you um, but if you just put your hand up um, and we'll start with David at the back there. Thanks Sue. Uh, I, until this evening I thought that Salt and Pepper were a hip-hop outfit out of New York from the 90s but I'm, I'm learning. Um, and I'm kind of wondering from a design point of view that the other equally curious term of silos which obviously comes from an agrarian lifestyle that we all used to have <laughs> What's the best way forward from a des what, what, what would a designer do? Should we go silo? Should we go salt and pepper? What's the best way to uh, approach? I guess it's an open question to the panel. Um, yeah. And can you tell, and it's a doublet in one sense, is can you tell the difference when you walk through? Can I just answer the last part of the question? The facts brief is that it should be indistinguishable. Okay. okay? It should have the same facilities, facade, entrance point, it should be seamlessly integrated. And again, we 100% support that. As to your other questions, I'd refer to Greater Minds. I mean, I'm, um, I, I think it should be indistinguishable. There's arguments on both sides, aren't there? I mean, I've, I can, um, and, I, and I'm going to echo what you said. It's not necessarily because the private renters or the private owners are going to experience a worse product if it's salt and peppered within the same block. I would say the con converse can be true as well, particularly in, in blocks where units are sold um, to investors and sometimes the relationship between the person living there and who owns it is actually quite difficult to trace and therefore the management is actually hard. Um, we've got providers who think both ways. Mm. What they don't want is a block that's obviously singled out as social housing. Mm. So I think my preference would be something with salt and peppered. As long as, and this is another tricky issue, and it comes back to something you were saying, Richard, about rents as well. A lot of strata just adds to the housing costs. Correct. So if you're looking at the affordable product, uh, which is that transitional one, 80% of market, add the strata on, it becomes completely unaffordable. So sometimes having that separate block, you can reduce the cost that you know, attributed to all those common th um, sort of facilities that a lot of tents will use, particularly when they're older. Did you want to comment, Don? Thank yeah, uh, I, I think there's a variety of uh, uh, different outcomes because there's different mm -hmm. circumstances. Um, there is quite a lo lot of research in the US that suggests that if you try to mix uh, social renters with homeowners, that it's difficult to go above a 20-25% threshold of mix. Uh, and for the estates to be really stable. <coughs> On the other hand, there's quite a lot of experience in the UK that if it's affordable housing, including homeowners and mixed tenures, uh, then you can go up to 50%. But if it was just simply 50% social renting, then you have uh, some issues around about that. 
Um, in some bigger schemes, uh, quite often uh, there are what has happened is to fulfill the affordable housing commitment that's been made, developers have actually developed the poorest houses in the worst part of the development uh, in relatively inaccessible ways. And in that case, the separation, as in Carlton, although I don't mean it's for the same reason in Carlton, uh, leads to a much worse outcome for uh, the social renters. I, I actually think that, you know, they leaving aside and I know you can't really leave aside the, uh, uh, the title uh, issues, uh, but I don't know how they work in Australia. I do actually think in mixing people in the same buildings mm. uh, can lead to more effective outcomes in, in some instances. But in others, I think you can also leave it separate. I'm sorry that's a kind of wishy-washy answer. It's just that there are different... Settings. What you don't want, though, are those poor doors which... Um have occurred in some of the um, London ones where it's the same building but separate entrances almost for mm. Sorry, just reason. to clarify, you said poor doors. Poor doors, yeah. Okay. Mm. There's another yeah. term, David. Poor doors. I think that, um, yeah. that offers some challenges for design. I'm just going if, around thinking about topography and all sorts of things yeah. and how you'd include that. Especially so. if your client wants you to maximise the value yeah. of mm. the ones he's going to sell. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that's a, that, I think that's, that's, a real, uh, that's a real challenge. Um, there's a question here. It's, it's more of a comment. Um, who, and who are you? Sorry, my name is Jill Barr from Elsa Consulting. Um, but I'm going to put on a, a government hat and say London Borough of Kensington and Chelsea. <laughs> Um, just to put in the, the UK experience, um, I was working at, um, in council at a time where affordable housing and how to deal with it was very prevalent. And a couple of the key messages was, do not pepper pot or salt and pepper. It doesn't work. Um, the property prices in London are significant and when you've got a... I'm just, a poorer family living to a richer family, it was causing a lot of conflict. The other thing is, as you touched on, is the management of the strata. Um, in wealthier buildings, people expect carpets and beautiful light fixtures. But the reality of it is, is that the, the CHPs can't afford to upkeep carpet. They want lino. But from the outside of the buildings, they look identical. Mm. And that became the key message, that there was a very big redevelopment scheme and the buildings were pepper potted, but not the units. The tenure is too difficult to manage and maintain in a building. It makes much more sense to split them, but to give them all the same facilities and integrate them that way from a management and cost perspective. So the whole pepper potting idea was tried and failed at that time, and decisions were being made between about 2005 and 10 in London not to go through a mixed tenure building, but to create a state of mixed tenure per building. Yeah. So it's quite different, the, the thoughts um, from that time. That, I, think, I think that's a really interesting, interesting comment. Are there any other questions? Yes. Bill, okay. first. Just picking up on that. Bill I, uh, Randolph. Bill Randolph from the UNSW. Just picking up on the last point, uh, it's interesting that uh, the Strava system here actually creates mixed tenure uh, as uh, from day one because uh, over half of all Strata units are bought by investors who are then, and the, the, the Strata is then occupied by renters. So you've got no idea if you buy a Strata to live in it, who's going to be living next door and um, there's absolutely no reason uh, why those tenants should be good or bad, but you've got no idea. So we actually have mixed tenure. I don't see a problem actually putting a few um, social housing tenants in the mix, I have to say. I understand what you're saying there. But another issue, when I've... So as I speak, as an old POM, I'm not Scottish, but... Um, <laughs> uh, We're not POMs, technically. <laughs> That's right. I'm a POM. That's you lot. I, yeah, I, I understand the subtle distinction. Um, but when I came here 18 years ago, I, I was imbued with all the sort of urban renewal that was going on in, in, in Europe and the UK and uh, understanding how it kind of works and thought, great, you know, this is fantastic. So we got some, we got some work with the Department of uh, Housing as it was then. It's been destroyed now. It's called something else. Housing is, is, a, is, a, is where you put poor people now. But, uh, and it was the, highlight, the high day of, of, uh, heyday of the NIP. Those of us who are slightly old know what the Neighbourhood Improvement Programme was, mm -hmm. the first real uh, 
urban renewal scheme in New South Wales, possibly, possibly in uh, in Australia, certainly one of the first ones. Anyway, so we did a big evaluation of it for the Department of Housing. Uh, it was actually commissioned by Jennifer Westacott, who was the Deputy uh, Director General in those days. And we, re Bruce Jernow, fantastic report. We thought it was. It took two years. In interviewed everybody. Um, uh, wrote a huge report, delivered it, and then we were told, you know, this report's never going to see the light of day. You were critical of the NIP, which I thought what evaluations were all about. Anyway, that's, a, that's a slightly getting me on, off, the, off the subject, but what, what I didn't realise at the time when I first came here was that uh, in the UK, now you, Duncan and Wendy may, 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 uh, may, may gain saving there, but when social housing was seen as a... As a as a, as, a, as a good in itself. In New South Wales and in Sydney, what it was seen as was a, a land asset which is owned by the state government. And when I said, well, why can't you just do some affordable housing on this, you know, to break it up and, and, and do some, somebody said, well, it's because of our AAA rating. Hmm. The Treasury will not do stock transfer because this asset they had, 130,000 units, was underpinning our AAA rating. And that was the most important thing, this Treasury was concerned. And it basically stymied any in innovation on public housing estates for maybe a, over a decade. Well, it Probably still does. Still yeah. It still, still does. Yeah. That's one of the issues here, is the state Treasury yep. is the dead hand of urban renewal. And it's the dead hand on urban growth as well, I think. Well, that's not, I, not I did a question, make, but it's a statement. I did make the comment that Economics 101 applied to a naive view of how housing mm. <coughs> economics operates leads to bad decisions, and that was what I particularly had in mind. I, I was familiar, uh, having worked as a chief economist in the state of Victoria, uh, I was familiar with the argument, and it's flawed at two levels. Uh, I do understand the preoccupation with the AAA rating, uh, local authorities in the UK have never had to worry about that because they do all their borrowing through the Public Works Loan Board, which uh, basically borrows money at the UK government's uh, uh, rating, which is still quite high. Um, but where it's flawed is at two levels. If you actually looked at the, ca the trajectory, I I'm very pleased to hear about all these positive schemes, but if you look from the outside, the trajectory of Australian public housing in the last, in the time I've known it in any detail, in the last 20 years has been there's less of it, it's poorer quality, and it's less well maintained year by year. Actually, the physical quality of the asset, I'm not talking about the land here, but the asset is actually declining. So is it AAA uh, stock in that regard? No, it isn't. But the real deception is the Treasury's put it on the books at full market value. Uh, that implies that there is no commitment on the part of the state to house these poor people. So there's a real political issue in there. There's a bit of economic double thing. Uh, and in fact, in the UK, the UK Treasury uh, does not take that view if land is in social housing. It is land, it is valued at social market value. It's different. If that's the use of the land, it's not full market value. And that has a knock-on effect when government wants to do something with that land because Treasury requires full market return. And that's been the problem, I think. Well, I think, I think that's something that uh, uh, is a really important area uh, to debate. And if housing policy is to move forward in any kind of level playing field, you really have to work on, on that. And that, there must be a federal opinion about that. Hal. Just on that, Hal Pawson from uh, University of New South Wales, just on that last point, uh, the, 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 the claim about um, credit ratings being at risk if, uh, if, if public housing assets are transferred out of public ownership is, a, is an old red herring. And it's a red herring because the ratings agencies are very well aware of the political doublespeak or economic doublespeak that, that, uh, that, that, that Duncan's mentioned. And they're also aware that um, the, the public housing stock is, 
it might be valued as though it was a huge asset, but in, in many ways, for the reasons Duncan said, it's actually a massive liability. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's a, it's a way, it's, it's, it's been a way of, um, of, uh, of avoiding change, of defending um, sure. empires, which Absolutely. I think um, doesn't really hold water. But just to go back to the, the, the point I was originally was going to make was connecting with the, dis the interesting discussion we were having before, the more, um, the, the more design discussion about uh, pepper potting or, or, um, or siloing or whatever terms you want to use. And I think there were, there's been some really great points made uh, in that discussion. And I agree with Duncan that there isn't any single right answer. But there are two interesting um, uh, examples in Sydney of, the, of two, um, I think, very well executed instances which, are, which illustrate the, the two um, models that have been discussed. In Bonnie Rig, you do have pepper potting. It's pepper potting of houses, which means that you don't have the, the problem of um, different income groups living within the same building. And some of the issues that Wendy mentioned of um, the uh, perhaps uh, undesirable nature of having to charge very poor people for some facilities like um, gyms or, or um, uh, very grand entranceways that they really don't want to pay for and shouldn't have to uh, through strata fees. Um, whereas um, in, the, in the example of the Riverwood uh, Renewal Project, which is another facts, uh, another facts project uh, working with PACE communities, that's a really good example, I think, of, um, of, of a high density renewal where um, it is blocks, it's not, it's not townhouses, which is primarily the, the built form in Bonnie Rig, it's larger blocks um, which have been um, made to look the same, uh, made to, designed to, so that they appear um, indistinguishable, but um, they are, uh, to use that uh, ugly word, siloed, and some, and some of them are uh, public, uh, or they're still uh, in, in rebuilt for social housing, and some of them are, uh, are, 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 private, are, are private sector. And I think, as an example of good ways to execute both models, I think those uh, are, are on a doorstep. Can I just say something? Because it comes back to the whole design issue, doesn't it? And when that happens and what you know about the people who are going to be moving into that accommodation. Um, I did some work when I was a consultant back in, in London and we were looking at some housing that had been allocated to, to key workers, so not the poorest of the poor. But that, that accommodation hadn't been designed with them in mind or their families in mind. It was, it was like a contribution through planning gain so the the block had been developed and so it was just t totally inappropriately designed for the people who went in there which caused the management problems not the individuals going in there but the design so if you know up front you're going to have multi-tenure and a mix of people and the older people or whatever and people with children you design it with that in mind with the facilities in mind you want to respond to that david i forget two questions <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure um, so the current Pritzker Prize winner, Alejandro Aravena, is a Chilean architect. I wish I could flash up an image of his work, but what he's been doing, as best as I understand it, is to provide these sort of really Spartan, and maybe that's a new word in the lexicon, uh, these kind of Spartan outcomes where he doesn't um, infill any of the, the, the sort of the soft things of kitchens and bathrooms, because his idea is that families come in and kind of make that their own. And I guess the architect in all of us wants to control things and make them fine and just right kind of thing. His view is that the bones and the skeletal structure are there and people will come along and change them as a design outcome. So it's a really design question, but I guess I'm interested in what the panel's thoughts are. As a different kind of a model is that there's this sort of skeletal structure, so you sort of stop at 70%. And, and can, can you, man, can you imagine and, the building regulations yeah, going know, along but, with that? But maybe there could be some fun there as well too. Yeah, yeah so maybe we less could. Less nanny, more interpretive. Push <laughs> some more disruptive <laughs> innovation. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Any, any, any thoughts? The phrase is delivering that now, Richard. No, we're not. <laughs> no, we're not. Um, and I, frankly, David, I just don't know how you'd go get around it. Mm. I mean, we don't know what the tenancy profiles will be yeah. in these estates. You know, there's a significant waiting list and there'll be people who'll be decanted to be rehoused and, you know, it's hard to predict the future. Mm. I, think, I think you're on to something and, you know, the guy that does um, Grand Designs, what's his name, Kevin McLeod, there's an apocryphal story I keep hearing that he's tried two hands at social housing mm. and one was where he got all the people to design and build themselves 
and it was a much smaller estate of, I don't know, 10 houses. You may know about it. Mm. And nobody could move in until they'd finished. Right? And they took great pride and 10 years later they're all still there and it's a huge success and the kids who you know, are doing PhDs in a context of social housing, it's a great success. And there's another one where Kevin designed it, as I'm sure you would, David, mm. very beautifully to the nth degree. You know, social housing tenants move in, huge failure. <laughs> they didn't like it. I'm not, you know, you know how I love architecture, but for whatever reason, if, we, if people can have ownership of that design, they're going to take more pride and you, you just think it's, it, it's, it's natural that it's going to be more successful. But in this system, I don't know how to get around that. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? Rod. Uh, Rod Simpson, I'm with the Greater Sydney Commission. Uh, I'm just reflecting on... Oh, there we go again. Um, <laughs> uh, I suppose it's a, it's a question about uh, housing as an intervention in the free operation of the market. Um, because that's essentially what planning is and always has been. And what we have is a system, uh, and I, I agree with you, it is a system that we've designed which actually has a series of assumptions. So when we rezone something and say you can only do townhouses here or apartments here or whatever, that's essentially an intervention in the market in whatever way. It's changing the value of the land and so forth. But then if we then go down to the next layer and say, well, is there an asset class which is affordable housing or there's an asset class which is social housing? And that in turn affects the land value. And that in turn also affects the management and the tenure. I don't think we've really teased it out enough. And I think there's so many, and it's not that we have to reinvent things, I think we just need to open our eyes to the way things work in the city right. already. And, and it's a complex thing, right? And there's layers upon layers mm. upon layers. And so this. the two examples I would use to talk about specifically um, the relationship between the way things normally work and the way things could work is first of all the affordable housing company, which is the City West Housing Company. Mm -hmm which addresses a lot of these issues, but most particularly it's designing to a price point, let's call it, by designing the accommodation appropriately, which accommodates transitions from low income to higher income within the one building, but also has essentially market rental, but it might still be lower market rental. Mm. Right, so that's, and the thing that I would ask about here is, you see, Sydney's very different to Glasgow, I hate to mention this, but you know, there's. I, I've never noticed. <laughs> there's a few. There's a few things that would be said, which says that the sign of a successful city is the unaffordability of its housing. I don't subscribe to that personally, but nevertheless, it is true. And the thing is that we haven't actually captured that. No, it's that. not. It's, well, uh, that's your definition of it. I think it's a sign of a failure. And a, a, a sign yeah. of failure of policy. No, it's a failure. You, uh, took, you, took, you started from a position saying intervention in the market, clearly not very enthusiastic about that. I like markets, but I recognise two things about them that come up in relation to housing. One, there are market failures. If you go to renew an older neighbourhood, the fact that people don't have in information about each other's intentions in a purely market system leads to uncertainties and non-investment. So you need signals, and planning can actually help in that. The second is, if you have inelastic supply, which you will have regardless of good or bad policy, you will drive up prices and a significant proportion of your economy is devoting to paying economic rent in the sense of more than you need to pay for the factors to be there. So I disagree with you fundamentally about your conception of the economy. Did you want to finish? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, uh, actually it's better, than, uh, uh, now, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, better to get, it's better to get the interjection because the point I'm trying to make, and I don't actually disagree with you, but what I am suggesting is that you can actually use that dynamic in a city where there's very high demand. True. Right? Well, and my is, point is, my, so my point is this, that Affordable housing, though it may not be built to the same standard as the market is used to, there is sufficient demand for enough people to decide to live there. And again, we only need to look around the city to see plenty of examples of that. I do not believe that the social housing that exists in Redfern has had any effect in the last 10 years on the value of housing in the streets adjacent. 
I agree. They are selling I for agree. millions but, of dollars. I agree, and, but so. And, but and, so. And, and so, 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 the, so, so the, the thing here is that then if you have that mix of housing asset classes within the one neighbourhood, so now we're talking about granularity. Yep. There's no fundamental reason why you can't have a top end set of apartments next to a, an affordable set of apartments because of the amount of demand, and that's why I'm going into yeah. that thing about the unaffordability, because actually we can take that pressure and I think use it to think about where things are located because the demand is so high that you can do what would normally be unthinkable in a, in a, in a market that's less demand. There, there, there may be something in that, Rod, but that, that market demand that we have now won't always be with us and has not always been with us over the last few cycles. But I think, there, hasn't there been research done? You, you, you're going to come in and help me on this, aren't you? There's research <laughs> done that has actually proved that there's an economic um, uplift to surrounding areas of renewing the states and putting back yeah. social housing there. Isn't, is that? Yes, but who gets the benefit of that economic and, uplift? It's, it's well, Gavin it goes Lewis, back to... It's Gavin it's, Wood's work that, yeah. uh, from the RMIT University mm -hmm. that, that Wendy's referring to. Um, and what that showed was that the Neighbourhood Renewal Programme in Victoria, um, perhaps in some circumstances of, uh, you know, where the context was not as high demand as we're looking at, just close to where we're sitting, mm. uh, maybe that was a slight difference. But in those circumstances, they were able to demonstrate that measuring the, um, the, the, the trend of, of, of house values in the surrounding areas around a number of estates that were renewed in, the, in that state of Victoria program, those, uh, in those areas, values uh, <coughs> rose uh, quicker than in comparable areas. And so they were able to calculate the economic benefit, almost all of which flowed to those, in those the, the, the owners who happened to be um, fortunate enough to live in those areas, and the state hardly recovered any of it because there was no value capture mechanism. Mm. And that, that obviously that, is something that we're talking about now, and it's, it's, just, you know, it's time that we did. That's right, and, and how that value capture is then used back into um, a structure of our housing policy that has both private, affordable and social. Okay. I mean, that, that, that's the thing, that, one of the things that worries me is that, that where we've got programs, we know we're going to get social and affordable and private. How it's allocated and designed is one thing, but we know we're going to get all three. Where we don't have programs and we just have the sale of public land um, on the assumption that the social housing must come back, but everything else might be private, yeah. we're not getting the affordable in there. And, and that's a, I think that's a real issue in terms of the structure of our communities. But it's, it's not for me to answer. I've got several questions going. John, you? Uh, yes. <laughs> my, my question panel is what? Uh, impact do you think density has on this question? And the background to my question is that we're now talking at Waterloo about developing some very, very high density residential as a mix of social and affordable and, and um, mm -hmm. private housing. I simply I'm unaware of any example anywhere in the world of the density that we're talking about at Waterloo, but I'd be fascinated with your comments about that. Um, <clears throat> if you, um, when I was working in the state government in Victoria, and it was shortly after Melbourne 2030 started being implemented, so the whole uh, there was a major lobby against density and, and densification and projects. If you actually did any analysis of the pattern of house prices in uh, Melbourne, you'd find that the most valuable homes were in the densest uh, developed areas. In other words, uh, density, historically it might have been associated with poverty and poor people leaving near to city centres on quite expensive land. But the reality is now that very often high density areas are quite high value. So. I think there's another so part to that. This is a slightly different question. Yeah. Yeah, but Where have we got anywhere densities that are proposed with a mixing of 30% social housing right, at that density? So if you are going to have, as Rod was talking about, uh, buildings of whatever 
how big are those buildings going to be? And, and in other words, if we put salt and pepper buildings as opposed to salt and pepper apartments, mm -hmm. how are we actually going to manage that? Yeah. Because the, the social housing buildings will be enormous. Mm -hmm. And so that consequently, we may have the same issues that we're trying to resolve right now. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm very aware of this because we had the pleasure of having one of our developments demolished because it didn't work. Yeah. One of our public housing projects mm -hmm. was demolished because it didn't work. Yeah. I think that comes back partly to what happens with the management then, doesn't it? Because that, that I, I, think, I think it does. And it also, I, I suppose there's two things here. First of all, social housing tenants are not all the same. Um, and not all of them require, um, I'm talking about them as things almost here, yeah. they don't all need sort of intensive management. If you think about who's living in social housing now, you probably find that 90% of them are very, uh, just like you and I really, but just poorer. Um, and in fact, a lot of them are going to be older people who will need support, but they're not going to be a problem. It's a very, very small percentage, I think, of social housing tenants. And that's where the, the quality and the money that's put into the management afterwards yeah. is going to make such a huge difference. Um, uh, and, and Richard talked about the social support services, but good tenancy management yeah. makes a difference as well. And starting from day one and recognising the issues beforehand, but it is a small percentage of social housing mm. tenants that cause 99% of what you read yeah. in the media. I think, if you looked at, I think if you looked at the suburb you mentioned, and I don't want to stigmatise anything, but with respect, faxes for... Um, um, opportunities to service those tenants in an appropriate way is probably pretty limited. Their resources are stretched. Right? And I think, I think Wendy's right. If, if the CHPs are given the opportunity to manage those tenants in an appropriate way, that small minority of those tenants who might be problems, as we in our gentrified way would see them, can be addressed. I think the other issue with that density is I think good density is about amenity. It's not about density. If you put that density out in an outer ring suburb with limited access to amenity, public transport, and all those sorts of things, I'm not disaster. The oh, I, th I I'm thought not you were concerned the about the density. No, I'm, I'm, what I'm asking is where has this mix been created at the density proposed? I'm well, not. The short answer is density. it probably hasn't been. Yeah. Uh, mm. it, I haven't. I'm not opposed to the density, mm. but I'm I mean, intrigued as to how we're going to make this work mm. because we're not talking about 100 dwellings a hectare. You know, we mm. might be talking three or 400 dwellings a hectare. <coughs> I mean, this is serious stuff. Yeah. You Which know? is more dense than any of the other suburbs that we have in Sydney. Correct. Well, so, well, well, the second so Ivanhoe, the second Communities Plus release is the Ivanhoe estate, and that will be 300 plus dwellings a hectare. Mm. Exactly. Um, we have some other small. questions. So yes. now. Yep. Uh, we live in a federal system, um, and one of the players that hasn't been mentioned tonight is federal government. <laughs> uh, now, in other countries, central governments have an important role in housing policy. The question to the panel is, um, what, should, what should the treasurer, the federal treasurer, have said tonight that would have assisted Sydney get an affordable housing? Uh, out, outcome. What should our Treasury have said? I just think that in uh, federal governments that um, if the federal government has a clear interest in housing uh, and should have a clear interest because housing outcomes, whether we look at environmental sustainability, productivity or social justice, um, Actually, are all uh, federal federal targets, federal outcomes, but clearly influenced by local and state behaviours. If you look at uh, questions about having environmental ta uh, targets for the reduction of carbon, uh, federal and national governments, at least most of them, signed up for it. But in fact, a lot of carbon reduction comes from decisions you make in city planning at city and state levels. So. Uh, there obviously should be an interest in the housing outcome from that point of view. Uh, I've already made the point that I think that uh, 
in a sense, not necessarily doing anything that re necessarily reduces house prices, but tries to assuage future increases so that Australian incomes are used more productively, should be, and will increasingly, you know, uh, in by 10 years from now, I think this will be more recognised as a direction that countries will be having to take. Um, I think you should be thinking, what are the devices and incentives at his hand that might actually reduce overall uh, inflation rates in, in, in property markets? And also, because federal government is concerned about educational and other outcomes, if you concentrate your poorest people or um, indigenous uh, populations are concentrated in particular ways, the educational outcomes will fail and you'll be back to human capital issues and all kinds of programs for the longer term. So yes, they should have, as well as also having a view of best practice across the states. Um, what should they have done tonight? Well, everyone in, uh, 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 well not everyone, uh, but the, I, I think the fairly sensible reforms of taxation that the Henry Review pronounced are still on the table. Um, I don't want to get into the domestic grief of negative gearing, that's for you to sort out, but I think there were important tax issues in there. I think that uh, if federal government is to give bite to the city deals idea, there will have to be some investment money on the table. I would love to see uh, the infrastructure aspect of housing be recognised in these budgets. Uh, and I think that there's a, a range of other things you might think of, but these would have been the two uh, most, most important. Uh, I also think, but you, I don't want to be unkind to state housing departments, and I know that people do much good work and new points about effective management can apply in all ten years. But I actually do think, uh, given the asset positions and given the need for flexibility, a stimulus to change towards transfer of housing to non-profits would also have been something. But it will probably only come out of federal action, uh, given the producer interest there is at the state level for not changing it. I'm just going to go very briefly, uh, Bill. I mean, I would like to have seen something acknowledging more about affordable housing and perhaps linking the money that comes from uh, the Commonwealth at the moment to outcomes that actually encourage um, the states to transfer property but also to invest or put in city deals that actually incentivise affordable housing. Yeah. And some form of daughter of NRAS improved would have been good as well, I think recognising that. They're doing work through the Affordable Housing Working Group at the moment, trying to get um, looking at financing arrangements. They're looking at a funding gap they know exists. Um, NRAS, uh, Mark II, probably would have solved that partly as well. So it's sending a message. They could have sent a message, a big message, I think, which they failed to do. Mm. Richard? Uh, uh, mm. Well, we don't know, but we... <laughs> <laughs> agree, with, agree with the comments about tax and Henry and all that stuff. I mean, what I would say would be far too radical and I'd get the sack. But um, if you could perhaps use a bit of imagination what has our housing systems, plural, market, social, etc., done over the last 20 years? And fast forward the next 20 years and imagine if that slide, both up and down, continues. What sort of a society would we have? Now, if nothing's changed, and it seems at the moment at least, like the politicians don't have the guts to change anything, and it's not just, it's housing, it's planning, it's the whole thing. And if they don't have to and they don't have the courage and the imagination to see what could happen and just leave it as it is, you know, I think there's some serious problems ahead. Julie? I've got a question for Duncan and then for you, Richard. Um, Duncan, you mentioned um, that we should be looking perhaps more carefully and closely at the Canadian experience. Mm. And Vancouver's not dissimilar. They've been pushing for density done there, done well there for a number of years. And I, my question is, um, for both Vancouver and even the Regent's Park example in Toronto, um, where you said that the um, redevelopment for private housing virtually paid for the redeveloped or rebuilt and 
increased social housing. The question is, how much um, is the ratio of, from an economic point of view, of the private housing is needed to fund the social housing in the Canadian experience? And Richard, do you have a, a gut feel for what it might be in the Australian experience? And also, who's funding, and there hasn't been any discussion tonight at all, about the other really critical social infrastructure amenities that must go with this, like schools, like public um, parks and sport and recreation facilities, those sorts of things that have to accompany this as well. Who pays for that and what extra add-on is that? That's well, in, in Canada, the only essential social infrastructure under the uh, Harper government were, was actually ice hockey halls. I signed off lots of them when I was Chief Economist in Infrastructure Canada. Um, but in terms of looking at how much do you need, I think the point you made about the pressures that there are in local settings uh, differ quite sharply from place to place. And to some extent, the market pressure is what determines the extent of up and also the, the planning change and the infrastructure change. Uh, in the case of Regent's Park, um, it was about, um, it was roughly 50-50, but that was because there had been such a huge uplift in the land value since it had been purchased, in effect. Uh, and that allowed um, the disposal of that land to private developers to pay for the refurbishment or rebuild of, of, of the other. So it was roughly 50-50. Um, the... In other settings, in, in, in the UK, for instance, whilst London for a long time was running at about 50%, but sometimes that would be uh, social housing and, and affordable home ownership mixed together, so the actual subsidy proportion varied quite significant. Uh, Edinburgh uh, tried, which is quite a pressured housing market um, in UK terms, after the southeast of England as uh, the highest prices. Um, it uh, uh, tried to go at 30% and failed. Uh, and in fact, because just the underlying land economics and the demand pressures at that particular point in time, it was only getting about 20% for uh, of affordable units on, on, on where it tried. That, and that's my recollection, Hal, of how, how it was when you were there. And of course, after the GFC, it, it all, but we're, we're, not, we're not getting anywhere near that at the moment. Richard. Um, the middle part of your question, I don't know that much about town planning, Julie, but I thought when an area got rezoned, there's a number of different economic studies, and if another oval or a school or some other piece of public infrastructure is required, uh, a detailed and well thought out section 94 plan is prepared. That's the theory, isn't it? All right. And that's done by our wonderful friends at Council and our wonderful friends in the Department of Planning and Environment. Isn't that the theory? But don't, don't you need a fairly significant uplift, is what I'm saying, uh, in density to, to fund all of this stuff? It de depends on the question of infrastructure. Mm. Sorry, I didn't come back on it at all. If it's a very much on a state infrastructure, mm. You, in Canada, they would be looking for that to be paid by the gain uplift as well. Yes. If it's more fundamental infrastructure, in, in the uh, Vancouver example, as I was telling you, where they did up, up quite big chunks of the city, uh, I put the question to the city of Vancouver, uh, but what about roads connecting? You know, the, what about the, the connecting infrastructure mm -hmm. within the city? And a very interesting answer where they said, we've not had one instance where a large project which has been optioned and backed by private, a private investor has been turned down for the connecting infrastructure into the bigger systems by the state, by the provincial level of government. In other words, it required the two levels of government that control different bits of the infrastructure system to actually play together. And in, in uh, British Columbia they have. In Toronto they haven't. And in Sydney I don't think they do it very well at all. To answer the third part of your question, I, I don't think you can, you can have a blanket rule as to how much market housing you need to pay for 
one social dwelling, if, if I'm interpreting your question, because the market is different everywhere. You know, whether you're between Sydney or Brisbane or Sydney or Parramatta or Penrith, the median price of the housing is always different. The costs might be kind of similar in a city, a bit more different state to state. And then, of course, you've got your Section 94 planning, VPAs, infrastructure, all that sort of stuff. So it, it, I, f I would find it impossible to answer that question with any sort of accuracy. David, you want a third I go? Have a third one. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> so, this, this probably has to be our last because okay, eight o'clock right, is upon I'll, us. I'll, I'll try and make it quick then. Um, so, just building on all of this, the whole issue of as we increase densities and all of the various models we might pursue, the provision of public space, I would have thought, becomes more and more important. And the vexing question, I think, that sits potentially before us, interwoven in all of this delivery of, of housing and living and, and you know, the places that we enjoy, is who provides that? Will it be the public purse or will it be the private purse? And I think it may well be the latter. Uh, and, you know, at its worst, that's probably the great North American mall of the 20th century. Uh, but it's, at its best, it could be something fantastic. So, you know, whilst we may well provide things that are able for people to live in, what about the spaces that we need to, you know, commune with each other and who will provide that? If, if you look at the Piemont Ultimo example, um, a lot of that, both the basic infrastructure of separating water and sewage, some of the regional open spaces, seed funding for the affordable housing program and seed funding for the light rail came from better cities. Yeah. Mm. So that was a federal, federal grant mm -hmm. as an incentive. And they, they added, we talked earlier about the importance of um, sort of incentive, mm. outcome requirements. In return for that money, 